Good morning and welcome to EG 2020 short paper session number five. To, to introduce myself, I'm Carlo Harvey, the session chair this morning. This session will present four papers covering topics, modeling, simulation, and visualization. Without further ado, let's get started straight away with our first paper for the session. This is entitled Frequency Aware Reconstruction of Fluid Simulations with Generative Networks. And this is authored by Simon Bieland, Vinicius Azevedo, Byung-Soo Kim, and Solanthe Barbara, presented by Vinicius Azevedo and Byung-Soo Kim. Thank you. Improves those results. Hello, I'm Simon Bieland and I'm presenting Frequency Aware Reconstruction of Fluid Simulations with Generative Networks, which I worked on with Vinicius Acevedo, Byung-Soo Kim, and Barbara Solenthaler. We built on a previous work called Deep Fluids by Kim et al that used simulation data and a set of input parameters, for example, a source position, an inflow speed, and also a time, to train a generative fluid CNN with the goal to reconstruct the given fluid simulation data, do interpolation between the input parameters, and also perform latent space simulations. This work had trouble reconstructing the high frequency detail in the given simulation data. For example, for this smoke plume here, we lose the curvy details in the middle of the plume, or for this highly turbulent velocity field on the right, we only get a smooth version of it. In this work, we want to focus on why this happens and how we can improve those results. First, we analyze the reconstruction quality using different visualizations and metrics. We then present a novel loss function in the Fourier domain and a corresponding heuristic. Finally, we show that this novel loss function improves the performance on our introduced metrics and leads also to visually better results. Loss functions are a crucial part of any machine learning method, but often don't get much attention. Chow et al. advocate to replace the standard L2 loss with a mixture of a perceptionally motivated loss function and an L1 error. But of course we're not limited to the image domain. For example, Wong et al. do image super resolution on faces using a wavelet loss. And Meyer et al. do video interpolation using a face loss. Recently, generative adversarial networks have gained a lot of attention. They use another network called the discriminator to model the loss function in an unsupervised way. As I already mentioned, we use deep fluids as a baseline for all our experiments. Deep fluids starts from a set of parameters C and wants to reconstruct the velocity field U hat of C. To do this, we first have a fully connected layer and a reshape to get to a lower resolution approximation of U hat of C. We then have a couple of big blocks that do an upsampling by a factor of 2 and have themselves a set of small blocks 
that have a convolution and leaky variable functions in between. They also have a skip connection to make learning easier. At the end, we have another set of convolutions and a leaky variable function. To get a divergence-free velocity field, we apply the curl to it at the end. Deep Fluids uses an L1 loss to get the reconstructed velocity field u hat of c close to the original uc. However, they had the issue that the L1 loss only enforces the local structure but not the global structure of the velocity field. That's why they also added a gradient loss and also an L1 loss function on the gradients of the velocity fields to get a better reconstruction. They also added a lambda to wait between to have a weight between the different terms. Since our loss function is based on the Fourier terms form, we do a short recap here. If we start with an image that has a sine function on it, like here, and perform a Fourier transform, we get to a Fourier image that looks like that, where the distance from the center of these dots represents the frequency of the sine wave. If we perform an inverse Fourier transform, we get back the original image. Similarly, if we have an image with a sine wave of a higher frequency and at a different angle, we get an, an image in the Fourier domain that has points with a larger distance from the origin representing the high frequency and a different angle representing the angle of the sine wave in the original image. And again, we can go back and forth between the two. And of course, this also works for entirely complex images that have complex Fourier domain equivalents. We can now use the tool of the Fourier transform to analyze our data of fluid simulations. If we do the Fourier transform on this velocity field here, we get something that looks like that. We can also go back again, of course. And if we now do a multiplication in the Fourier domain with the image on the right, we get a Gaussian blur in the original image. We can approximate this Gaussian blur with a circular filter that looks like that. And if we perform the inverse Fourier transform, we get a velocity field that looks similar to the one from the Gaussian blur. Of course, we can also do the inverse of only performing the inverse Fourier transform of the higher frequencies. So we invert the circle, perform the inverse Fourier transform, and we get only the high frequency detail of the image. To summarize, we have the highest frequencies, the outside of the Fourier domain, and as we get closer to the center, we have the lower frequencies. We can space this by rectangles, as shown here, or also by circles, as shown at the bottom. We can now use this to analyze our problem. We start from a reconstructed velocity field from our baseline on the left here, with a detail at the bottom. And of course, if you compare this to the simulation data, the ground width data on the right, we see that a lot of high frequency detail is missing. If we now filter the ground truth data and only use the lowest 20 bands of a total of 80, we get something that looks like that, which is quite close to the baseline. So this shows that the highest, higher 60 bands don't really get reconstructed by the baseline. If we do the same thing but use the lowest 30 bands for reconstruction, then we see that it's already a lot closer to the ground truth data and a lot better than the baseline. This shows that only adding a bit more of the mid frequencies is already enough to get a better reconstruction. This also shows in a metric we call the mean relative error. It is defined as the sum of the differences in the complex norm between the reconstructed and the ground truth data of a band, normalized by the sum of magnitudes of the ground truth data of the same band. If we plot this over all our 80 bands, we get a curve that looks like that. If we remember from the left side that the highest frequencies are not really important, but already reconstructing accurately to the bands to between 30 and 40 is more than enough. We know that the right side of the bands of 40 to 80 can be disregarded and we can focus on the left side of this graph. 
Another metric that highlights the shortcomings of the baseline L1 loss is the ratio of standard deviations, meaning the standard deviation of the reconstructed magnitudes separated by band relative to the standard deviation of the ground truth data. If we look at bands 20 to 30, we see that only about 60% of the ground truth standard deviation gets reconstructed, so the reconstruction is focused more on the mean. One interpretation of this is that to achieve a low error on multiple different samples, the network strives for values that are universally appropriate and therefore are more or less the mean. This is also visible in the histogram plot on the right that shows the log magnitude of the velocity fields. Again, the baseline is more focused on the mean than actually approximating the ground truth data distribution. To overcome these issues, we present a novel loss function in the Fourier domain that is able to focus on the crucial bands that we previously found. We start from a training sample that consists of parameters C and the ground truth velocity field UC. We pass the parameter C through the generator G and get a reconstructed velocity field U hat of C and we compute the Fourier transform Ft of u hat of c. We do the same, i.e. compute the Fourier transform also for the ground truth data. We then filter out the lowest frequencies and compute an L1 loss on them. Similarly, we also do this for the, for the low to mid frequencies and then we have to add some weights W0 and W1 to wait between the lowest and the low to mid frequencies. We then also add the mid frequencies, the mid to high frequencies and the highest frequencies. All these terms now make up our loss function we call the Fourier loss. For L1 loss we have different options. One of them is to use the difference in magnitude or we could use the difference in phase, but we opted for the last one, the difference in the Fourier domain and then taking the norm because it intrinsically incorporates the magnitude and the phase. To find weights for the different bands, we came up with a heuristic that we call shift towards slow, or short STL, and it works as follows. Let's take band 2 for example. It consists of 576 pixels which make up 0.047 of the total pixels in the image. We can double this value and round a bit to get 0.1. We do this doubling of the fraction for the band 0 to 3, but we halve band 4. The intuition behind this is that putting less weight on the highest frequencies, which are mostly noise anyway, we free up capacity in the network to reconstruct the lower and mid frequencies which are more important for visual quality more accurately. On the right you can see the mean relative error plot that we introduced at the beginning of a network trained with STL compared to a network trained with the baseline. You can see that the mean relative error is a lot lower between the bands 10 to about 30 and then matches the error of the baseline for the higher frequencies. So putting less weight on the higher frequencies is actually not destroying our results. If we zoom in a bit, we see that we also are a bit worse at the lowest bands, but as we will show later, this is not a problem. STL now serves as a good starting point to investigate the effect of the different weights. Here we show again the same mean relative error plot with the baseline in black and STL in red. If we now put more weight, exactly doubling the weight of STL on band 3, we see that the error around band 20 to 25 gets decreased, as we expect, and the error at the lower frequencies, around band 10, gets increased. Similarly, if we halve the weight of band 3, the error at bands 10 to 25 increases, and the error at band 10 decreases. We were also able to visually improve our results. Here you see the baseline and on the right side a detail of the image on the left. 
this is the STL reconstruction, and this is the ground truth data. And here, all next to each other. We see that we get a lot more detail in the STL reconstruction than the baseline, and the STL reconstruction also matches the ground truth. Similarly here, the plume example, again with the detail on the right. This is the baseline, this is with STL, and this is the ground truth data. Here again, the baseline, STL and ground truth details all next to each other. We see that the curve structure inside the plume gets reconstructed much more accurately in STL than the baseline. Also, our advection results improve. If we look at the individual frames, here the baseline, STL and ground truth next to each other, we see that a lot more detail is visible in the STL reconstruction. We also compare against a patch scan variant of a generative adversarial network. Here you see one of the results. This is the corresponding ground truth data, and this is the baseline reconstruction. As we can see, the GAN is able to produce high frequency data, but it does not match the ground truth data accurately, whereas the baseline only produces low frequency data, but it actually matches the ground truth. This also shows in the mean relative error, where the GAN has a higher error over all bands because it just does not match the ground truth data. Using the GAN, we can also show that our log magnitude histogram is a good proxy for evaluating high frequency convergence. In black is again the baseline and in blue the ground truth data. In green you see the log magnitude histogram of the GAN which matches the ground truth data much more closely. STL is slightly better than the baseline and already matching the ground truth data a bit better. Looking at the ratio of standard deviations, we see a similar result. STL outperforms the baseline, meaning that it has a higher ratio of standard deviation and does not focus as much on the mean as the baseline. For the GAN, this value is almost 1 because it approximates the ground truth data distribution the best. To summarize, we performed an analysis on our problem using the ratio of standard deviation, the histogram of log magnitudes and the mean relative error. We came up with a new loss function, the Fourier loss function, and the corresponding heuristics called shift towards slow, and we were able to outperform our baseline on the metrics and also visually. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, what I would like to uh, start off with, because it looks like we don't have any questions from the audience just yet, is uh, to be very indulgent and start off myself. Um, I was wondering as to the intuition that existed between um, the circular band masks and the rectangular band masks for your frequency uh, separation in the Fourier domain. So you had low, low to mid, mid, uh, mid to high and high. I'm uh, just wondering what the intuition there is in terms of uh, the effect it has on the human visual system? Um, I think we experimented it with both the rectangular and the circular masks. And we experimented also with Gaussian uh, filtering instead of like doing uh, ideal band pass filters, we just did uh, Gaussian on the, on the masks. And I don't remember that if we actually get so much difference. So at the end, we just went for the rectangular mask on because at the end, we, we ended up testing a lot of different parameters, like the weights, the shift towards low part of the presentation, I think was the hardest part to, to kind of tune. And uh, we just went with some, one simple masking strategy and then, yeah, just went up with that. But we didn't see too much difference between uh, uh, ideal band pass filter, the square or, or the circular uh, mask strategies. 
And presumably, in a similar vein, uh, you expen experimented with pilot studies on different frequency bands as well. So rather than five separations, potentially more or less. Yeah. And five yeah. seems to be the ideal value. Um, so far as, as yeah, the experimentation went, uh, for the data set that we were working with, because uh, velocity fields are a little bit different than image-based data sets. So for velocity fields, we have we don't have too much higher frequencies as uh, compared uh, with images. Images have a lot of edges and sharp corners and uh, stuff like that. Whereas velocity fields, they're usually solved through a Poisson equation at some point. So that kind of smooths out your velocity field so you don't have a lot of high frequencies. So we went with that, uh, with that assumption to our data. And then therefore, like the band four there, the, the last separation, I didn't have too much weight because that basically didn't matter so much for for uh, our data set. But if someone is testing it in a different data set, then maybe you want to vary the, the number of bands you use for each each uh, part of the area. Uh, we've got a question coming on the Discord channel uh, from Mark McLaughlin. Uh, did the mask with such sharp edges produce any problems with ringing? Yes. Yes. Um, that, that's a good observation that like usually you, you do have ringing artifacts. Um, but again, I, I remember that we did test with Gaussian filtering with uh, not ideal uh, bandpass filtering. And at the end for the network, it didn't matter too much in terms of the, uh, of the quality of the reconstruction. Uh, we did see ringing artifacts if you just like do the, the bandpass filtering, but for the training, uh, we didn't see too much of those artifacts at the end. I don't think there are any more questions at the moment, so I'd like very much to, to thank you both uh, for a wonderful presentation. I thought that was uh, very engaging and uh, very clear. So thank you both very much. Um, to move on to our next paper for the session, I'd like to introduce uh, Procedural 3D Asteroid Surface Detail Synthesis. Uh, this is authored by Zhiji Li, Rene Weller, and Gabriel Zachman. And uh, this is presented by Zhiji Li. Thank you. Hello everyone, today I want to introduce our recent work about asteroid synthesis. I'm from the University of Bremen, Germany. Our work begins from the requirement of real space missions. Before we start mission, usually we will build a virtual environment to validate our design. For instance, we need a virtual test bed with surface details to help testing the terrain-based navigation system and also the optic-based tracking and landing system. Moreover, we can print the virtual testbed into a physical mockups to test our device in the physical world. Another application is space movies and games. Different from the space mission simulation, where only diverse surface details are required, here, the shape of asteroid must vary a lot to create a realistic space scene. So our method must able to generate diverse global shapes as well as diverse surface details. From the Earth's observation system, such as light curve invention, be static radar, we can obtain lots of real shape of asteroid, but without surface details. In recent decades, several space missions have been captured a bunch of real images from the real asteroid surface. Here we can notice the uneven distribution of craters and also the distribution of terrain primitives. And the distribution of terrain primitives is spatial heterogeneity. Some place uh, we can notice some places with dense rocks and others are flat. Also, high resolution models are important for space simulation, especially when the spacecraft moving towards the asteroid, and we need to generate a level of details images for the simulation. In 2014, Martin generated some asteroids for testing the spacecraft landing system. Based on a handmade global subdivision surface, they directly overlapping the real heat map of craters 
onto its surface and achieve good result, but it's cumbersome, cumbersome and uh, the manipulation is unintuitive. In 2016, Heavy proposed locally controlled spotlights successfully transfer a group of eclipse shapes from the curl to the textures and uh, able to generate macro structures in texture space. Uh, our approach is a fully implicit representation of 3D asteroid with the equation Fp. By computing the ISO value of each point in 3D space, we can obtain the surface of asteroid. Our pipeline begins from the constraint shape. And uh, in the first step, we use a group of metaballs to represent the global shape of asteroid. Then, in the second step, we use a Lloyd's model to overlap the volumetric terrain on the global shape. Our Lloyd's model can generate macro, micro and macro structures on the surface, especially boulders and uh, craters. Our contribution is the asteroid model consists of smooth global shape and surface details. And the asteroid model must evaluate for each point in 3D space and can achieve arbitrary resolutions. Our Lloyd's model able to generate rocks, craters, and some terrain details. Also, you can see the, um, some real images uh, of asteroid surface. Um, it, from the image, you can see the macro structures such as rocks, boulders, and uh, some different size of craters. And also, you can notice some micro structures on the surface of asteroids. Our method is um, our modeling system is actually a semi automatic asteroid modeling system and uh, can give the user an intuitive manipulations. And anyone can manipulate a few parameters to generate ideal results. Recap the step one how to modeling uh, global shape. In order to generate surface, our method begins from the from a prototype surface, low poly mesh. Then we use a sphere packing algorithms to fill the low poly mesh with spheres. Then we can compute the potential fill inside the asteroid. And finally, with a particle swarm optimization algorithm, we can get the optimized smooth global shape. And in the second step, we want to generate volumetric terrain from our Lloyd's model. Uh, at first, we must clear that the impact cratering are the dominant geological process of asteroid. And most asteroid surfaces are heavily distributed with diverse craters and the rocks. For instance, on the asteroid Lutalia, we can find lots of type 1 craters, which is a normal crater origin from the impact on the bedrock and with the bowl shaped interiors. In the lunar surface, we can see the type 2 craters called volcanic shape crater. It comes from the impact on the dust surface and the uh, uh, volcanic shape interiors. Then for the distribution of the boulder, we can clearly see their distribution is, is a local, local clustering distribution. That means the distribution of the boulders are different from their locations. Finally, for recent images from the asteroid blue, we can have we can see lots of surface details with a rent, which is a random process. Their distribution is a random process. And in order to generate macro structures, we use locally controlled spotlights. 
which we can transfer the color shape into the textures and is very suitable for generating macro structures. The impasse point PL, which is an offset to the central point P, and uh, this random list can simulate the distribution of the macro structures such as rocks and uh, craters. For simplification, we draw the color shape in 3D in flatland at first. For the shape of color 1, we have two parameters to control the type 1 crater's radius and height, and the three parameters to control the shape of color 2 and generate type 2 craters. With the beta, we can, generate, we can manipulate the outer range of the craters and the gamma, the inner range, inner radius, and the kappa, we can generate the height, the height of the craters. Then we can visualize the curlo in 3D space. In order to project the curlo into our implicit surface, we can compute the we can compute the normals for each point on the implicit surface and build a projection matrix for each point. And then we can get the final color shape in, on our implicit surface. In the result on the left images, we can notice the borders of diverse shapes overlapping on the implicit surface. And they are generated by uh, curl 1. And by simply inverse the uh, value, we can generate borders. And uh, if I inverse it again, then we can generate type 1 craters on the right side. On the right side is uh, two type of craters. Uh, you can see the uh, here is the volcanic shape craters and uh, generated by our curl 2. And uh, the red part is a group of curl, a, a group of normal craters, type 1 craters, and generated by our curl 1. Uh, in order to generate macro structures, let's uh, recap the gaboloid by example at first. Gaboloids. Um, it's actually a convolution of random distribution gobble curl in pass with random weight values. If we do the Fourier transform on the gobble noise, we can find the power spectrum is the gobble curl because the convolution in the spatial domain is actually a multiplication in the power spectrum. So the gobble curl. So the uh, power spectrum of the gabo curlo is the same with the gabo alloys. And the gabo curlo is a multiplication of a Gaussian function with a harmonic function. So we can draw the power spectrum of the gabo curlos and we can notice three parameters. In th with three parameters, we can manipulate the shape of the gabo curlos. We can build the collections of the gaboloids with the gabo curls. So the gaboloids, by example, origin from the input example textures. We can compute the power spectrum of the input textures, and then we can put the, a a group of uh, gabo curls into the power spectrum. Then we can get a pro approximation of gabo curls to to the giving input examples. And here is a, here we can get a robust parameter estimation from the paper of Gaboloid by example algorithms. In our uh, Gaboloid by example algorithm, we use a parameter B to control the size of Gabo colors called sparseless. Uh, for the the larger the value will be, the higher the, pro the approximation will be. For instance, uh, if we give in the power spectrum, and we can compute approximation of the double curls to the input power spectrum. And if we increase the value B, our double curls shrink. That means we can get a um, higher accuracy approximation to the given power spectrum.
then our approximation is, is, is better. So the B is a specialist parameter to control our result. And uh, then we can change in the pixel positions in 2D space, to, in 2D space into 3D space point. That means we can um, change the gray values of the 2D in 2D space into the height value in 3D space. Then we can generate some terrain patterns on the implicit surface. Uh, also, we use the uh, co-layers to, by mixturing different ex input example textures, we can generate different, we can mixture different type of terrain primitive some tiny uh, micro terrain primitives. Then we can generate more complex terrain and to make it more realistic. Uh, finally, our terrain model is a mixture of garboloids and stoloids. That means for each point in 3D space, we're overlapping several layers of terrain primitives. In order to achieve spatial heterogeneity, different points must have different ways for their Lloyd's model. So we design an inverse distance weight by evaluating the distance from the surface points P with the inner metaphor. So we can split the asteroid surface into different parts and assign different weight values to achieve spatial heterogeneity. On the left side is a real asteroid blue, and the data was obtained several months ago by LASA. And the right side is the result with synthesis. We generate the shape looks alike. Two other asteroids, Itokawa and Eros, based on their low poly constraint shape. Our method able to generate diverse global shape and with several intuitive parameters to synthesize a wide variety of surface details. Our major um, we have improved the traditional 2D procedural texture into 3D implicit terrain synthesis and achieve good result. We also pro propose a Leo Lloyd's model to generate macro and micro terrain structures. Our representation is fully implicit make it possible to compute for each point in parallel. Even non-professionals can uh, able to manipulate parameters to generate diverse realistic, realistic 3D asteroid models quite easily. Uh, one, uh, our limitation is our macrostructures are synthesized by a group of specially designed equations, and they have potential to generate more patterns in the future, we can integrate physically based Lloyds such as flow Lloyds and curl Lloyds to make our terrain more natural and suitable for more things such as desert or some rivers. And we can also accelerate our computation of garbo Lloyds with the newest research to further accelerate the computations of asteroid models. Thank you, and uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk, Xi Um I'd like to open up the field to uh, any questions from the audience, either via Discord channel or the YouTube chat. But in the interim, I'll start off with questions myself. So, um, Xi Zhili, I was wondering, is there any way um, or any prohibition in the current method that would stop implicit surface generation via observation from an image, let's say. So I noticed that you had the um, Bianu or asteroid in the end there, and you're trying to recreate that asteroid. Um, 
one of the things that I'd like to see in the future potentially is recreating implicit surfaces directly from uh, image observations. So is there anything in the technique as you've described that would prevent that from happening? Um, if you want to generate I, um, implicit surface from images, I think um, that's possible. Uh, because our our method is based on sphere packing, yeah. So you you must give a constraint, a water titan constraint shape at first. So if you can, I, I, I remember there's some papers you can generate some um, mesh from the images. So if you can, in the pre-processing step, you can generate mesh directly from the images, and then we can use the sphere packing to generate the uh, reconstruct the uh, mesh and then we can implicit uh, the gotcha. images. Thank you. Um, another question that occurred to me throughout that was um, the, the low cost, uh, so you, you observed through um, anecdotal observations of imageries from, from the boulders on asteroids that there was a tendency to have local frequency, sorry, local clustering distributions uh, on the surface of the asteroid. Um, I, I just wondered how you went about going about strategizing a way to encode that into the technique. So, sorry, I, I didn't get it. That's all right. Uh, so I was wondering how you went about coming up with an idea to encode that local clustering into the implicit surface generation. Um, um, because uh, um, uh, in the spotlights, you have some impasse randomly distributed in, a, in each cell. So you can use in the um, you, you can decide some distribution functions. Uh, so, uh, here I use in the Poisson distributions, but you can use in some other clustering distributions to manipulate the, the distribution of impasse. And then in that way, for each impasse, you can put a rock or crater here. So if you can des design some um, clustering distribution functions, then you can distract, uh, you can you can manipulate the distribution of rocks or boulders, some clustering. Okay, uh, perfect. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think we've had any questions from the audience, so I'd like to say thank you very much, Gigi Lee, for that wonderful talk. Uh, claps in chat, please. And. Uh, that was that was another another wonderful example of these these virtual presentations and engaging media content. So again, uh, thank you very much. Moving on to our next paper, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce a paper entitled "Interactive Assembly and Animation of 3D Digital Garments." This is authored by Pontus Paul, Oscar Nylon, Yuko Ishiwaka, Suda Kazuto, and Marco Fatiga Gangeli, uh, and this is presented by Oscar Nylon and. Pontus Paul. Thank you. We present a novel real-time tool for sewing together 2D patterns, enabling quick assembly of visually plausible, interactively animated garments for virtual characters. The process is assisted by visual hints and allows designers to import 2D patterns from any computer-aided design tool connect them together using seams around the 3D character with any body type and assess the garment in motion during the character animation. The cloth is numerically simulated, including a robust collision handling system. The combination of our semi-automatic sewing system and the interactive garment simulation makes quick prototyping with immediate feedback possible. As a result, it could speed up the content production pipeline for visual effects applications involving clothed characters. The manufacturing of garments in the physical world relies heavily on the use of two-dimensional patterns. These are templates that capture the dimensions and the shape of a specific garment, which can be used for mass production. The process of creating a tailor-made garment includes taking measurements, creating patterns, cutting the cloth according to the patterns, and finally sewing together all the parts of the garment. In order to perpetuate and leverage on this existing knowledge in garment design, new approaches should support this kind of workflow. 
efforts have been made to recreate the tailoring process in a digital context. The work by Umetame provides an interactive workflow that allows for drawing patterns in 2D and seeing the resulting garments updated on a character in real time. Seams can be created by specifying two boundary segments. The work by Bertosos instead automatically parsed existing sewing patterns from a dataset and recreated the garments in 3D by extracting the shapes from the line segments and using machine learning to interpret the seam configuration. For real-time simulation of cloth, a simplified model using particles and constraints has become the industry standard. A particle has a position, a velocity and a mass. Constraints are then defined between the particles to restrict their motion. A prime example of the usage of this model is the physics engine Flex, which employs the model not only for simulating cloth, but also for interactions between cloth, rigid bodies and fluids. All objects are discretized using voxelization and each resulting voxel is turned into a particle. Since Flex was first released, more recent research has shown how to optimize these kind of simulations by exploiting the parallel nature of the GPU. Our system can be split up into three separate steps. In the first step, 2D garment patterns are imported. Our system currently accepts files using the DXF format, which is the industry standard for manufacturing of garments. However, it could easily be extended to accept any other format used to store a closed 2D contour. The imported patterns are automatically triangulated using a fixed, regular sampling of the contour, which ensures that contours of the same length will have the same number of vertices. Enforcing this constraint allows for creating a simple one-to-one -one mapping between vertices belonging to a seam. The second step involves placing the patterns around the character body in 3D space, so that they can be sewn together. This is done using a simple user interface where the patches can be translated, rotated and scaled to fit the character body. As you can see, the sleeves of the dress in the picture are also bent around the arms in order to make sewing possible. Once the patches have been mapped to the correct parts of the character body, seams are semi-automatically created between different parts of the patch contours. Finally, in the third step, we start the simulation. The simulator is based on a GPU implementation of position-based dynamics. A particle is created for each vertex of the input mesh, and a distance constraint is created for each edge between the two particles. Once the necessary data structures have been built, the seams are enforced, and then the other forces such as gravity are enabled to produce a realistic garment motion. Seams are defined as a one-to-one -one mapping between two ordered sets of vertices A and B. To create the first set A, the user clicks on the vertex to define the green starting point of the seam, and then moves the mouse to another vertex to define the red endpoint. All the yellow intermediary points are automatically added to the seam. The same process is then repeated on another contour to produce the second set B. During simulation, the vertices from the two sets that have corresponding indices will always be kept at the same point in space. To further reduce the amount of time spent on creating seams, parts of a contour that lie between sharp corners can be automatically highlighted and selected. To create a seam, the user simply hovers the mouse over the desired part of a contour, clicks to select it and repeats the process for the other side of the seam. Where the seam should start and stop is determined based on the location of the mouse and the angle of the corners of the contour. The threshold of this angle can be decided by the user. When the mesh topology changes on a patch, either as a result of increased polygonal resolution or non-uniform scaling, it is important that the seams the user has created can be reused. To keep the scenes consistent, even though the points used to define them have changed, the system automatically recreates them. By comparing the positions of the seams start and end points in the original mesh to their counterparts in the updated mesh, their indices and the indices of the in-between vertices are recomputed using the list of contour points for the updated mesh. In some cases, for example, when creating a seam from one part of a patch to another part on the same patch, it is necessary first to fold or bend the patch around the limbs of the character. 
Our system provides a simple interface for this, allowing the user to select along which axis the bend should be performed and whether or not it should be bent symmetrically on both sides of this axis. One important thing to note is that by bending a mesh this way, the distances of the edges between the vertices may change slightly, which in turn changes the rest length of the distance constraints defined from those edges. This results in an undesirable stretching problem. In order for the pattern to keep its original shape even after it's been bent, the original rest values computed from the imported flat configuration are used. To give users more control over how the garment behaves during simulation, our system provides a vertex painting tool for fine-tuning parameters such as kinetic friction, static friction, and mass. This, for example, allows the user to simulate different materials for different patches, or even for each individual vertex. Another use of the vertex painting system is collision masks which make it possible to exclude different parts of either the garment or the character body from the collision detection system on a per vertex basis. By painting the pants in the picture green and the arms red, we can make sure that unwanted collisions between the arms and the pants are ignored. This is especially important when using the system together with a performance-driven animation system like motion capture in which case noise in the recording can make limbs reach unnatural positions, such as an arm entering the torso. Where the user has defined seams between patches, we need to create extra constraints to accommodate for these seams. The seams between corresponding vertices are modeled as distance constraints with zero rest length. In this way, as soon as the simulation starts, the vertices connected by a seam are always kept at the same position during the animation. Since seams also influence the bending behavior of a garment, we define a hinge edge constraint on the overlapping sewn edges. Both bending and distance stiffnesses can be defined by the user for each individual seam. In the following slides, we will briefly talk about how the collisions between the cloth and the character mesh are handled, but the same principles are used for the self collisions. We use a uniform spatial hash map to store the collision data structures. Similar time, low memory footprint, and reduced cache misses. The information needed to build this data structure is the following the spatial position of the triangles in the mesh, the spatial size of each cell. This is said to be the average edge length of the mesh triangles. The maximum size of the hash map. This size is said to be a number of times larger than the number of primitives in the mesh. The larger the size is, the fewer hash collision we get at the expense of more memory required. This parameter can be tuned according to the circumstances. Since the hash map will have to be updated each frame according to the character animation, it is very important that this process is fast. Therefore, we insert each triangle in parallel on the GPU. The index at which the triangle is inserted depends on the hash index, which we calculate using the hash function proposed by Techner et al where n is the hash map size, l is the cell size, and ix, iy, and iz represents the triangle position in grid coordinates. In the figure, you can see how the data is changed if one primitive moves from one frame to another. The memory is kept constant, but we might get hash collisions. This is not a big problem unless we get extremely many hash collisions and the size of the buckets run out. When handling the collisions, we calculate the hash index of each cloth particle using the same equation and check if there is any triangle at that hash index. If there is, we simply check if the particle is placed above or below the triangle and handle the potential collision accordingly. When handling the collision, we also apply friction using the Coulomb model, considering the relative velocities between the triangle and the colliding particles. All of this is done for each cloth particle in parallel on the GPU. Using a uniform spatial hash map has many benefits with regards to access time, memory handling, cache misses, etc. But it requires the mesh to have triangles of similar size. If the size of the triangles we insert into the hash map varies a lot, the risk for hash collisions increases, which in turn reduces the benefits of the data structure. Therefore, we remesh the mesh collider to accommodate this using centroidal Voronoi tessellation presented by Liu et al. Now we will show you an interactive demo, screen captured from a Unity standalone. 
Here we show the system during simulation with some real-time user interaction. This demo was recorded using a laptop equipped with a GTX 1070 graphics card. All garments are made using triangulated 2D patterns and have been sewn together using our system. The collision system can robustly handle both tight-fitting clothes and high-energy character motion at interactive speeds. Every vertex of the garment is simulated, with no skinning or gluing to the character. Here we pause the animation of the character to make a small adjustment to the dress. Note how the cloth is tight on the character body, and the collision detection and response are able to handle high energy motions like this short jump. Garments and mesh collators are fully disconnected, which means that the same garment can be worn by different characters, and the same character can wear different clothes. In conclusion, our solution provides a simple workflow for quickly turning 2D patterns into 3D garments. If the user wants to modify the garment topology after running the simulation, that can be done without having to recreate the seams, which produces a favorable environment for experimentation. Additionally, our fast collision detection system can be adjusted on a per vertex level to avoid unwanted collisions due to impossible character configurations resulting from motion capture. These contributions make our system suitable for virtual productions where massive amounts of content must be created quickly, as in modern real-time filmmaking relying on performance-driven animation. Our system is fast, robust, and plausible enough to produce believable cloth animations on different body types. A considerable limitation is the fact that the current sewing system requires the number of vertices on both sides of the seam to be equal. As can be seen in the image to the right, if the number of vertices vary, the full length of the contour won't be covered by the seam. In the future, we will focus on generalizing the stitching functionalities to account for this problem. We will also implement a more accurate friction model, continuous collision detection, and precise non-linear solvers. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Hey, thank you very much for that talk. Um, we've got some questions coming through on the Discord channel, and I'd like to invite anybody on YouTube who's just observing that paper to uh, post any questions they may have as well. Um, the question is coming through from Mark McLaughlin, so I'll let him start off with the questioning for this. Okay, so question from Mark McLaughlin. From what I understood, seams are handled through constraints rather than vertex collapsing of the mesh. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Okay, perfect. Um, on average, how long does the seaming process take from your UI perspective? I got the impression that that was a fairly lengthy process. Um, I'd say it depends on the type of garment you have. If you have to create a lot of seams and have to uh, approach the garment from different angles and so on. Uh, but it, it can take anywhere from 20 seconds to 10, 15 minutes, depending on the garment. Okay, so not that onerous, actually. Um, linking back to what you said in regards to the, the actual garment size and I guess the complexity of the, the, the DXF drawing that's imported, um, you, you mentioned hash map sizes earlier and especially how that related to any uh, conflicts, spatial conflicts with uh, any bin collisions. Um, do you take any strategies or heuristics to mitigate the impact of those collisions in terms of uh, refactoring the model um, to, to mitigate the impact of uh, or potential chance of many collisions happening? Uh, yeah, I can answer that question. Uh, and uh, basically, we've just uh, employed like trial and error. 
and uh, uh, experimented the size of the hash maps. Uh, so we don't have any like sophisticated approach to calculating the, the size. Uh, basically, it's uh, it's uh, depending on the number of vertices in the cloth or in the character. Okay, thank you very much. A question has just come through on YouTube from Christopher Brandt. If I only have a collection of poses, but no animations between those poses, could you transport the fitted clothes between the poses, or would it require positioning the clothes for each pose again? Well, you could um, seal the clothes to one pose, and then you could animate and the cloth would follow. Uh, am I understanding the question correctly? Um, could you transport the fitted clothes between the poses or would it require re uh, positioning the clothes for each pose again? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Christopher, can you confirm? I mean, you could linearly interpolate the actual animation and simulate during the same time. Uh, and then the cloth would follow into those poses. But if you only have the poses, then you need to like re sew the cloth around those poses. Great. Um, OK, uh, thank you very much um, for that wonderful talk. Again, the media is just fantastic and truly engaging. It's a fantastic way of having these talks, I think, uh, especially given the circumstances. Um, OK, so there's actually a follow-on question before I wrap up. So Christopher Brandt has said, right, um, but I would have to somehow interpolate between the poses. And that's actually confirming what you've just said, right? Is that correct? So interpolating between the poses that existed and then the cloth would follow. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yep. Perfect. OK, uh, thank you very much um, for, for, the, for the talk. And we'll actually move on to the final um, paper of this session now. Um, this paper is entitled Scatnostics JS, uh, Extended Scatterpot Visual Features for the Web. And this is authored by Vung Pham and Tommy Dang. And uh, the, th the presenter for this particular paper will be Vung Pham. Thank you very much. Scatnostics JS, Extended Scatterplot Visual Features for the Web by Vung Pham and Tommy Dang from Interactive Data Visualization Lab Computer Science Department, Texas State University. Scanner Sticks is a set of features that characterize the data distribution in scatter plots. There are nine scores in Scanner Sticks, including of outlying, skewed, sparse, clumpy, striated, convex, skinny, stringy, and monotonic. However, there is no formally published implementation 3D or higher dimension Scatnostic. This project aims to provide Scatnostic implementation in JavaScript called Scatnostic JS and also extend these measures to 3D and higher dimensional scatter points. Binning. Binning helps to reduce the computation expenses. There are two standard ways to bin scatter plots, hexagon versus leader bins. In 2D version, we provide users option to choose either binning methods in 3D and ND versions, the binning rhythm is leader bins. 2D implementations. In 2D implementations, these are the six main computation types. First, normalization. Second, binning. the triangulation. Fourth, building minimum spanning tree. Fifth, finding the degree one and two vertices. And finally, finding convex hole or concave hole. With the six main computation tasks, we will be able to calculate nine scatnostic measures out of them. 3D implementations. For 3D implementations, MST-based scores such as outlying, skewed, clumpy, stringy scores, they rely on distribution of MST edge lengths and the conclusions remain the same as in 2D implementation. For the SPAC score, it's also calculated based on MS3 edge length distribution. However, when the dimensions increase, it is possible to get the values which is greater than 1 for this score. That's why its implementation will be discussed later in ND version. For outlying, skewed, clumpy, and stringy, these are 3D typical scatter plots for them. 3D striated score. Striated patterns include a parallel line, smooth lines, and parallel planes in 3D. Stride score is revised to count on the angle between axis and planes formed by every three consecutive MST edges. So in 2D version, 
they only consider the cosine theta between the every two edges of the MST which is smaller than minus 0 0.75. However, in 3D, between the plane the consecutive edges, we also consider the cases which cosine of the theta which is greater than 0 0.75 as well. That's why we need to use the absolute signs over here. To clarify this case, we add three examples over here, two parallel planes, four parallel lines, and a smooth line. For two parallel planes, if we don't use the absolute sign, the score is 0 0.53, 0 0.65 for a fourth parallel line, and 0 for this smooth line. However, if we apply the absolute cosine to consider for this case, then the score will be 0 0.85 for the two planes, the 0 0.92 for the four parallel lines, and also one for this very smooth line. This one is more reasonable. Convex and skinny scores in 3D. The convex and concave holes calculations in 3D are similar in 2D except the line is conceptually converted into plane and the radius for the circle used to calculate the alpha hole becomes the radius for the sphere in 3D. And also the convex now instead of considering the area we need to consider the volume for the upper hole and the convex hole and also for the skinny score we um, consider volume and the surface instead of area and the perimeter also we adopt the constants here to make sure that the sphere will have their skinny score of one here are two exemplar plots for convex score in 3D and skinny score in 3D. It is also worth noting that we adopt the algorithm from Robert Nuremberg to compute the volume from 3D holes from its set of faces. This is very efficient algorithm. Monotonic score in 3D. The monotonic score is calculated via the partial collision among the three variables. So we take the maximums of the partial score of every pair of the three variables. Here is an exemplar sample plot for monotonic score in 3D. ND implementation. In ND, outline, skewed, clumpies, and stringy scores rely on the distributions of MST lengths, thus the conclusion remain the same. Monotonic score is concluded via the partial correlation of the variables. Here are the exemplar plots for outlying, skewed, clumpy, stringy, and monotonic in higher dimensions. The sparse score was originally calculated as Q90 of the MS3 edge length. When the number's dimensions n increase, this value can be greater than 1. Therefore, in 3D and ND versions, this value is normalized to put dimension n into account. The sparse score now is divided by 2 times of the dimensions over 3. This one is to guarantee that the value would not get over 1 and it's gonna be compatible with the 2D version 2. To clarify this one, we give an examples of two synthesized sets of points in 6 dimensions and 10 dimensions correspondingly. The twos are very similar, except that one has six dimension and another one has ten dimensions. If we simply use Q90, then the first one will have sparse score of 1.76 and the second one will have a score of 2.17. And if we do outline the normalization factors over here, then the sparse score for both plots get into 0.88. This one is a reasonable number because the two plots are very similar except for uh, different numbers of dimensions only. Convex and skinny scores are based on the convex and alpha hole calculations which have performance constraints in higher dimension. Even with approximation, these conclusions are exponential to dimensions and vertices inside the plot. Therefore, we do not provide convex and skinny scores for this uh, current version of the ND implementation. Similarly, striated score, there is no cross product of two vectors with dimensions higher than three. There is not often much reason to use lines and planes in high dimensions as well. So there is no such information about corners between lines or planes in Andes in the space with more than three dimensions. Therefore, at this time, we do not provide implementation for striated scores either. Scalastic JS evaluation. We evaluate the scanner stage implementation with six real data sets. They are US implement rate, 
U.S. employment net jinx, prevalence of HIV, unemployment rate, world life expectancies, New York stock etchings. These are the corresponding example plot. Currently, the time-consuming commission tasks are triangulation and building the minimum spanning trees from the data point, while calculating score is fast. Furthermore, we also generated a set of synthesized plots for each of the targeting diagnostic measures. It's worth noting that the score for the measures that the plots target are flat with higher values for 2D versions, for 3D versions, and also for higher dimensions. Use cases. To demonstrate the usefulness of Scagnostic JS, we also applied it in monitoring critical variables of a high performance computing center. First, we use 3D version to monitor CPU temperatures and fan speed for computers in this center. We compute the outline contribution for each compute at a time step as the difference of the outline score of the whole set of computes at that time and the outline scores of the same set of computes when leave that single item out. The red computes are those with outline score contributions higher than a threshold. Also, the performance of Scagnostic JS allows us to do this calculation in real time for this monitoring task. This also shows its usefulness in detecting several of abnormal events happen in these HPC centers. Please refer to these papers for further details about this use case and this application. We also use ND version to monitor variables critical to this HPC center such as CPU temperature, fan speed, memory usage, so on and so forth. Similar to the previous use case, we also use leave one out strategy which is to calculate the overall online score at a time step and comparing to the score when leave one compute out to know its contribution to the overall online score. Also, radar chart now is used to visualize the 9 dimension instead of the 2D scatter plot. We currently use Euclidean distance as the distance matrix, but other options such as L1 or LK, where K can be a fraction, should be explored as well in the future. This application has to monitor the 9 critical variables well. For instance, in this case, it has to highlight the compute 6.2 with high values of almost all the variables. On the other hand, the compute 8PV is having low values for these variables in this period of time. These events are important in this center because it helps to suggest the system administrators to check on these special nodes. It also helps to indicate the load balancing issues in this center. Please refer to this paper for further details about this event and this application. Scanostic JS implementation. The Scanostic JS API reference can be found in this link. And there are 2D, 3D, and ND versions of this as well. Furthermore, we also provide Scanostic Playground as an online demo on which you can explore underlying Scanostic calculation processes and the visualization of the intermediate results as well. They contain exemplar scatter plot for each of the nine Scanostic like uh, mentions. You can explore all the conclusion stages by resist links. From here, you can find the API references, including of the 2D, um, 3D, and ND versions as well. You will know how to install them, how to download them, or how to use CDN version of the library. There will be a uh, user manual and also code snippets as well for each of the versions. Furthermore, you can click on each of the links over here to um, explore the underlying computations of each version. Let's say this one is an example of the um, outline scatter plots. And you can try to um, do the binning. Also, create the triangulations. Then uh, building the minimum spanning tree from the triangulations, also finding the outlying links, okay. also um, finding the outlying points. Uh, you can find the no outlying points. Then you'll find the um, V2 corners over here. And also you can calculate the um, convex hole and also the concave hole as well.
they will help you to calculate the stochastic scores. Similarly, you can explore the 3D version of it or the ND version of it. Thank you, and if you have any questions you can address now or please contact us at um, ttu.edu and to me at um, ttu.edu as well. And here is a list of references to the papers about our use cases. Thank you for Okay, thank you for that talk, uh, Vong Pham. Uh, I'd like to open up questions for uh, the YouTube audience and also the Discord channel audience for anybody uh, that has a question. Um, but I'll, I'll start off myself. If I'm understanding correctly, you're able to, well, obviously you've got a wide tool set that allows you to do some diagnostics in, in scatter plots, both in 2D and 3D. And right. the impact of this is clear because you've got a GitHub project that people can use and integrate into their own projects. That's fabulous. It's just the kind of thing we'd like to see in the community. Um, one of the things that I'd love to investigate a little bit more through the Q&A session is the determination of outliers. So if I'm correct, you've got some threshold that you're working on uh, assessing where outliers exist. Um, and I'm just wondering what the intuition was, what was on that threshold determination. Yeah, actually, for the current vision, we're using the two key uh, like box plot rules. So it's about 1.5 of the interquartile range, far like the Q. It's going to be like uh, uh, upper of the Q3 plus 1.5 of the interquartile range. So that one is the normal outlying um, uh, so detection. But that, yeah, but that uh, constant like 1.5 of IQR, you can always change it into 3 point or maybe uh, lower it to 1.0 to, how do I say, uh, be flexible and fit with the uh, application need. So in, inside the reference, you can see uh, the option to uh, input that uh, outlying, conf uh, outlying constants as well. So okay. it's, it's really flexible for the user. So effectively, you've got a baseline IQR for outlier determination, and that has a variable that then can influence when that outlier is determined or not. Right. Yes. Okay, perfect. And that's fully extensible through yes. the API. That's really, really yes. nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, we got a question from YouTube um, from Francesco Bantele. Um, are you going to integrate more colors in the next iteration? Uh, going to colors more in the next iteration. Yeah. I actually don't understand uh, what does the colors work with the, uh, this one? I'm sorry. Uh, I suspect it's just more of a feature set for the API for visualization. Oh, I see. So, so currently, this this feature set is only working for um, the distributions of the points in the scatter plots. So, actually, having about finding features for colors is also an interesting point, but. We didn't work on that, actually. For this one, we work on the features of the distributions of the points inside the scatter plots in uh, 2D, in 3D, or in uh, higher dimensions. OK. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, it would be interesting to see extensions that allow uh, more perceptually uniform exploration right. of color space to help and right. improve the visualization. Right. That, that is a great point. That is yeah. a great point. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so Francesco Bantele has asked, and given the use case and applications that you've extolled throughout the, the presentation, have you tried it on uh, COVID-19 data? Uh, this one is actually we were trying with some uh, distributions of the uh, tweets data, but then we haven't finished that one. So, so far, we haven't got any uh, interesting result regarding that. So it's very much watch this space. You're going to be publishing a blog, blog article as soon as that's done, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, you can comment that uh, link to the blog article on this um, 
YouTube catch up, I think, uh, as and when you're, you're done, because I think that'll be very valuable for anybody. Yeah, right now, I think most of us work on the COVID 19 data, and in our lab, we do explore that direction as well. Perfect. Yes. Um, are there any more questions from either Discord or YouTube for now? Okay, we've got a question from Douglas Cedrim Oliveira. Um, regarding performance, is there a limitation on dimensions and the minimum spanning tree calculations? Yes, yes, actually, yes. So, in uh, in especially in if you have the dimensions which is higher than um, which is higher than uh, ten, so in that case, the the binning process is very important. So normally, by the default, by the original. Uh, um, creator of this characteristic. Every time when you do the binning, the size of the bin will be reduced by a half. So if it's for two dimensions, then it's going to be reduced by four times. But if you have like 10 dimensions and every dimension reduced by a half, then it's going to be reduced jumping up and down very high because it's, it's, it's like now in exponential already. So in that case, we uh, in the user uh, in the API references, actually, we do provide an option, which is instead of cutting them to half, we make a linear line. So you may uh, design on the slope or the reducing of the uh, binning size when you when you run over the program, because if you like reduce by half at a time, then it's too much, because it's gonna be two power of ten if you have ten dimensions. So the amount of pins are jumping up and forth is a lot. So in that case, uh, we provide the, the API option to instead of reducing a half, you may just create a slope of your needs. Maybe it's lower, maybe it's higher. So the number of pins going to be appropriate. That is the that is the uh, way that we were working on that. First, I, I mean, just, just because it's long, so I'll summarize. First, we want to use binning to reduce the number of uh, points to, 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 to process the data. But then when you use binning and uh, number of pins may be uh, very sensitive. So uh, we need to have an option to increase or reduce the number of pins in in appropriate uh, manner by provi by providing the option to um, put the way you reduce or increase the pins uh, next time you try. Perfect. So the uh, the the answer is there is a limitation on the dimensions for MSGs, yes. but there is an optionality in the API uh, that yes. allows you to mitigate that. Uh, right. Just, right. Right. Perfect. Right. Okay. Yeah. Incredibly interesting discussion that's been going on. Uh, just wait another uh, few seconds if there are any more questions coming through before we uh, look to close the session. No. In which case. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers uh, for today's session uh, for EJ Short Papers 5, Modeling, Simulation and Visualization. If we can have uh, the claps in chat for all of the speakers, I thought they were all phenomenal. Uh, thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you, Francesco.